The career of Robert Schumann is one that is often misunderstood and underestimated, and his long undeserved status of one trick pony is one that is only now being given a closer look. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Robert Schumann. Robert Schumann was born in Zwickau, in Saxony. He was the youngest child in the family and was exposed to all sorts of music and literature from some of the finest artistic minds of the day. From the start, Schumann's mind was absorbed in the process of composing and writing, and his mind often equated the two creative processes. In his career, he often equated music with literature. To be more specific, he thought of music as a form of expression similar to literature, not exactly literature in and of itself. His youthful attempts at composition were fun little pieces to which he apparently gave no great credence. He was constantly in the process of discovering new music of the era. Franz Schubert had only recently passed away, and this took an emotional toll on the young Schumann, uh, but he was just as obsessed with Schubert's works as he was with the writings of Jean Paul. Schumann wanted a career in music very badly, but his parents and his family were less than assured of his financial status should he become a musician. So they encouraged him to go off to law school, and he went off to law school, but he cut most of his classes in favor of studying music on his own. On one occasion, he had such an itch to play the piano that he actually posed as a member of a royal court and went into a piano shop in order to try out all of their pianos and played each one in succession and uh, lasted in there about three or four hours then left, never to be seen from by the shop owner again. When his many imploring letters finally convinced his family, particularly his mother, that he had an inner conviction to pursue a career in music, Schumann, a fine pianist, began studies with Friedrich Wieck, a terribly abusive man who promised Schumann fame and fortune in a concertizing career after just a few short years of study. Schumann lived with the family, although he was horrified by the kind of abuses Wieck would dole out on his family. In fact, he would only spare the rod when it came to the finest pianist in the family, his daughter Clara. Soon, Schumann injured a finger on his hand while using a bizarre device intended to increase finger stretch and velocity, so he turned his musical studies to the compositional art, and he let Clara play his pieces. Schumann's compositional career got off to a bit of a slow start, but it eventually took off, and he was becoming deeply involved in the musical world. He took to music criticism in order to pay the bills, and his florid writing style got much attention, famously promoting Frederick Chopin as, Hats off, gentlemen! A genius! But he was also very pointed against the composers he did not like, and he did not like the group of composers known as the New German School, which were come to encompass Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner. They like to think of their music as the music of the future, but to Schumann, their music was filled with all kinds of trite stupidity. Despite increasing tension, Liszt and Schumann remained quite cordial to each other, and it's interesting to note that both composers' greatest single-movement solo piano works bear dedication to the other. Schumann's love life during this period was an absolute mess. He had fallen in love with Clara, but he knew that they couldn't be public. He had a romance with Ernestine von Fricken and was engaged to be married, uh, but broke off the engagement when he learned that she was born out of wedlock. Which was alright by him because he had never really fallen out of love with Clara anyway. Clara was now 15 and the couple made it official, and while they tried to keep it a secret, Friedrich eventually found out and he was not happy with Schumann for it. He insulted and threatened Schumann and then kicked him out of the house. In our time, the nine-year age gap between the two would make this kind of creepy, but this was not actually Friedrich's objection. It was a different time. Anyway, Schumann was able to keep in touch with Clara, particularly with the help of a maid who was sympathetic to their cause. His romantic misadventures only fueled his compositional creativity. Bizarrely, Friedrich, who also tightly controlled Clara's career as a piano virtuoso, was totally fine with her performing Schumann's music. As she grew older, she often chose not to. She believed in Schumann's genius, but she also knew what the public was and wasn't prepared for. She only introduced pieces when she felt that they were ready to be introduced. Meanwhile, Schumann was writing some of his most famous pieces for the piano, almost exclusively for the piano, including Carnival, Dances of the League of David, the Symphonic Etudes, Kinderscenen, Chrysleriana, and the C Major Fantasy. Careful analysis of his piano music during his forced separation from Clara reveals use of hidden musical motifs intended to reflect Clara and his love for her. 
And it must be noted that Schumann did not actually have the greatest mental health. From his earliest days as a music critic, he would split his personality into two opposing forces, naming them Floristan and Eusebius. In Carnival and The Dances of League of David, both pieces, which are collections of small works intended to represent Schumann and his friends, we see Schumann create portraits of himself not as one character, but as two halves, Floristan and Eusebius. It is likely, although not proven, about which more later, that Schumann had at one point contracted syphilis, a nasty venereal disease that, at that point, had no known cure. Only nasty mercury-based treatments were available. Schumann continued to employ Friedrich to reconsider his position and remained at the utmost level of professionalism throughout the entire proceedings. Friedrich first objected to Schumann's financial situation, but as Schumann proved that he could provide for Clara, uh, Friedrich would just move the proverbial goalposts. There was absolutely nothing that Schumann could do to prove to Friedrich that he was a worthy husband for his daughter. Schumann did not actually seek to sour the relationship, because he thought that being nice would eventually make Friedrich relent, but he never did. And although they were very cautious as a couple to make this step, they eventually realized that they had to go to court. In court, Friedrich pulled out all the stops, baselessly accusing Schumann of every nasty, vicious, and amoral thing in the book. But the couple was prepared, pulling out evidence to the contrary of whatever Friedrich might say. And when Friedrich eventually realized that there was absolutely no way he would win the battle, he simply stopped showing up, making the court wait out every single waiting period. It was the only way that he could delay the marriage. What a nasty dude. Anyway, this understandably took an emotional toll on the couple, specifically Schumann, uh, but they eventually got the go-aheads from the court to get married, and they got married the day before Clara's 21st birthday. Friedrich promptly disowned them and took all of the money that Clara had ever made during her career as a concertizing piano virtuoso. And this is obviously a very unethical thing to do, but there was nothing legally that they could do about it. He was her manager. It was the terms of how she was able to make money as a minor. Undaunted, the Schumanns began an extraordinary, unprecedented, and highly successful musical partnership. Clara balanced a home life full of raising many bustling children while continuing to perform, while Robert was able to continue dual careers as composer and critic. Clara made more money than he did, but it didn't really bother him all that much. He was just glad that they were both happy. He even encouraged Clara's attempts at composition, which are no means minor. Although Clara herself had a very low opinion of her compositions, Schumann's work from here on out can be categorized into incredible productivity and in successive genres. First, he started out in a year of song, where he wrote basically 200 songs. He wrote nothing but just songs, constantly. Later years, he would focus on symphonic works and oratorios. His productivity is often focused on very short periods of time, which we can keep track through his meticulously kept diaries. It's through these diaries that we are able to know that he was able to write a symphony in two weeks. If I try to write a symphony in two weeks, my hand would fall off. His mental health began to be a real problem, especially when accompanying Clara on her grueling concert trips, but being left at home made him desperately lonely for Clara's presence. Whenever he got into a funk, though, he did one thing and one thing only, break out his box scores and study himself some counterpoint, which often cured whatever was ailing him. He became obsessed with old music, and his scholarly pursuits led him to rediscover the magic of Renaissance madrigals. And he was also one of the first musicians to be able to go through Franz Schubert's unpublished works, where he came across what was heretofore one of the largest orchestral compositions ever written, what became known as Schubert's Great C Major Symphony, his Ninth Symphony. The main glimpse we have into the Schumann's married life is their marriage diary, which stems from their shyness and the fact that they had to communicate through most of their courtship through the written word. It is through this that we can see the mental deterioration of Schumann. He became a very sick man very quickly. He initially complained of episodes of paralysis and psychotic episodes that would leave him bedridden, although these were infrequent enough that he was still able to function normally most of the time. He remained strong in the face of these issues, and with Clara they continued to be active in music. He was appointed a choir director in Dusseldorf, and they had to move there in order for him to fulfill that role. Unfortunately, even though he was a good composer, he was not a good conductor. In fact, he was a horrible conductor. Combined with his mental issues, they eventually had to slowly phase him out, which was quite insulting to him, but to be honest, it was probably good for the ensemble. He was just holding them back. 
He continued to be a respected voice as a music critic, and was the one to introduce the young Johannes Brahms to the world, calling him a young eagle, and categorizing him as some kind of savior of music against the face of the new German school of Liszt and Wagner. This occurred after Brahms showed up on the door one day and stayed for a couple weeks. Robert soon began categorizing his collected works, and not a moment too soon as it turned out. He began complaining of ringing in his ears, ringing that turned into solid pitches, and then melodies, and then full works, full pieces of music that he swore had to come from heaven. At one point, he had a hallucination that Schubert had risen up out of his grave and given him a theme, upon which he promptly composed variations. The worst part about Schumann's psychosis is the fact that he knew what was going on. In his moments of clarity, he knew that he was losing his mind, and expressed to Clara that he feared for her safety should he go crazy in her presence. His condition reached a point where he attempted suicide by jumping off a bridge, and he was then taken to an asylum where he lived down the rest of his two years in solitude. At least the asylum was one of the best available at the time. This was an era when the mentally ill were treated as something less than human, and he was at a place which treated him like a person, which was nice. But he slowly continued to lose his mind, and eventually died in 1856, at the age of 46. He finally saw Clara again two days before his death, when he was in a severely weakened state. While the prevailing view is that of a man who succumbed to syphilis, the autopsy revealed that he actually had a brain tumor which would account for many of the symptoms that he had expressed in his later life. Many of the pieces he wrote during his final illness were suppressed by Clara and Brahms, who finished Robert's job of categorizing his collected works. And even though they tried to suppress the later works, they weren't able to do so. In fact, the violin concerto that he wrote during this period of insanity actually has managed to enter the repertoire. Clara Schumann continued to concertize in her long widowhood and pretty much established what it meant to be a modern performer. She established the modern repertoire and the modern recital format. She's pretty interesting in her own right, so she'll have a video all to herself. Most of Schumann's output is for the piano, which has led to his status as one-trick pony. He does not have strong orchestral pieces. He liked to use all of the orchestra all of the time, and he was inept as a conductor. While he has moments of brilliance in pieces that are still less than well known, conductors often turn to editing Schumann's pieces for their orchestras and reorchestrating his pieces. It is said that no orchestra gets famous off of playing Schumann. He valued rhythmic complexity and rhythmic ambiguity, something that Brahms would continue to develop, and his ideas on a synthesis of music and literature form the basis of ideas that would continue to influence the musical world for a long time thereafter.